ready. Yeah. Yes. This is the Ross Kaminsky Show. You're a great American. Now, Ross Kaminsky. Come on, man. On Denver's talk station, 630 KHOW. Let's go. All right, good morning. It's Tuesday. I'm Ross. Thanks so much for being with me. I am so pleased to go to our VIP line for a conversation that I've been hoping to have for such a long time. Uh, Not just because I've been to Durban, South Africa, but so pleased to welcome to the show the pride of Natal, Laura Logan, Fox (laughs) Nation host of Laura Logan Has No Agenda. She's got more awards for journalism than than you can name, including the prestigious Daniel Pearl Award and the Murrow Award. Laura, good morning, and thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, and uh, I love South Africa. I know you're not there anymore. I just got to tell you, it's one of my fa- The nicest people in the world are from South Africa. And I'm not just saying that because you're here today. Um, my you- home and my heart, you know? Yeah, absolutely love it. So you know more about and have better sources at the U.S.-Mexico border than anybody I know. And this has become an enormous issue already, although you probably wouldn't know it if you were only somebody who imbibed mainstream media. And so I want to talk about two separate things with you, the issue itself and then Mm -hmm. separately how the media is treating the issue. And let's start with the issue itself because it is more important. What is happening at our border right now? And can you help us understand the degree and the rapidity of the change since President Biden became president? Yes. Well, so it's really interesting because, once again, the only time we're talking about the border is when there's a humanitarian crisis. What we, what we just ignore most of the time is the security crisis that exists on the border, which is there regardless of the, the immigration issues. But politically, you know, both sides are guilty of framing this entire conversation in terms of immigration and migrant care and not allowing any space for really addressing the security issues. And what goes to the heart of the security issue is the transformation of the Mexican cartels, who are no longer the guys growing marijuana and sending it over the border that they were in the 1970s, right? These are now the most powerful criminal organizations on Earth. They operate globally. They control more than 90% of the global trade in narcotics. So whether you're buying drugs in Timbuktu or in Rio de Janeiro or New York City, it doesn't matter. You're buying them from the Mexican cartels. Mm -hmm. And what we're also not talking about is the strategic partnership between the Mexican cartels and the Chinese, who have introduced uh, to this country the most lethal street drugs in the history of narcotics. And uh, the, the Chinese were able to take what they um, acquired when U.S. pharmaceutical companies farmed out the manufacturing to China. They were able to uh, take those formulas, and they took one for fentanyl that had been used in surgery and in hospitals for years, and they introduced that to the street as, a, as an illegal narcotic. And they created a demand for it. They created an addiction problem. And that, that is the reason the opioid crisis, even though prescription drugs are down drastically, you don't hear of any drastic decline in the number of um, addicts or in the number of people dying from overdoses, more than 80,000 in the last fiscal year. The number just keeps climbing. And that's because the Chinese have made a strategic partnership with the Mexican cartels, and they are killing Americans in far greater numbers than we've ever seen. They are flooding the streets of this country with quantities of narcotics that are unprecedented. And then when prescription drugs start being available, they sent over uh, fake counterfeit pills. So your child can be 14 years old, never done a drug in their life. They think they're taking a Xanax or an Adderall to stay up for, you know, to study something to calm their nerves if it's Xanax, and they're not. They're taking a fake counterfeit pill made by the kings of counterfeit, the Chinese, who are sending the pill presses and the color dyes and all the the things that you need to, to make counterfeit materials, sending those along with the precursor chemicals to the cartels who are now making the narcotics themselves. And people wow. think they know what this is. They think they, you know, well, you know, I smoked weed before. I don't believe the DEA. I grew up in the Just Say No campaign. You've never dealt with anything like this because they're mixing fentanyl into every drug you can think of. And when the DEA tells you that they're seizing over a million pills a day at the southern border, what they're not telling you is that 
that the intelligence estimates are they only seize less than 5% of the illegal narcotics that um, are in this country. And when they're testing them in the lab, they're founding a minimum of 27% contain enough fentanyl to kill you. Not fentanyl to get you high, fentanyl to kill you. So all of this is going on completely obscured and overshadowed by the immigration crisis, which has taken place at lightning speed, but is still not as fast as it would have been if Texas had not gone to a court and prevented the Biden administration from implementing one of their campaign promises, which was to put a 100-day stay on all deportations. So can you imagine that means that every person coming across the border who makes it in cannot be deported. It's not just about what's happening on the southern border with Border Patrol and those agencies. It's about the fact that ICE and the Immigration immigration Enforcement Agency has been prevented from doing its job. So even if you uh, even if you get caught at the border by Border Patrol and released into the country with a notice to appear, you know, um, and legal documentation, it doesn't it mean a thing because ICE can't enforce it. Huh. They're under orders from the administration not to enforce it. And also something really odd is happening that I can't get answers to. And maybe you can or someone else out there has the answer. But the Biden administration, they ended the Trump emergency declaration for the border, which should have ended with an executive order. Now, that should have ended funding, federal funding for the border crisis and also for um, DOD assets. Department of Defense has had National Guard helicopters and soldiers down at the border assisting Border Patrol agencies down there. And um, when that executive order ended that emergency, you know, that crisis declaration, all of those assets should have been withdrawn. Mm. But they're still down there. And when I talk to the you know agents down there and law enforcement sources, nobody knows why they're still there. Because in theory, this administration has ended that. So there's no answers coming from the administration on that. DOD doesn't seem to have any answers. Their wow. press people are saying, no, we don't, they're going to stay. And the other thing that's weird is that the Biden administration has not made any public statement on Title 42. What is Title 42? Well, during the pandemic, because Mexico is a hotspot, the Trump administration was able, under health, public health guidelines, get a Title 42 order where they can return anybody coming out of Mexico. They can just send them right back and into Mexico. Now, that is no uh, that is no longer in place. That ended at 1,400 on the 21st of February. But their Border Patrol agencies are still returning people under Title 42. They are not returning people who are unaccompanied minors, do not get sent back, and family groups with a child of age 7 or under. Do not get sent back. And there's one other category. All the people Mexico doesn't want. So if you're from Yemen or some another Islamic country or you're from China, Mexico says, no thanks, we don't want you back. So the Biden administration is having to deal with that. And wow. yet you still have this explosion in the numbers. Can you imagine if you weren't sending back adults under Title 42 and you didn't have the freeze on all deportations? the numbers would be even higher. And the other thing they don't tell you is that the numbers don't include several other categories, gotaways, for example. So in fe February, the numbers were over 100,000 mm -hmm. people came into the country illegally. Well, you know, that also includes 26,000 gotaways. There are others under the category of turnbacks. Those are people who, when they were, you know, when they were spotted or they were chased, went back into Mexico. Then there's also the category of non-violations, where they're still determining which category you fit in. So, you know, there's there's lots of layers built into the numbers that don't give you the full picture unless you study it. Wow. My special guest, Laura Logan, Fox Nation host of Laura Logan Has No Agenda. Um, let's just do a little bit more on the China-Mexico thing, and then I want to get to a couple other things. So for, for years, it, it seemed pretty clear that the Mexican cartels essentially controlled the government and had, you know, had bought off enough politicians and judges and police officers. There was a period yeah. of time where it seemed like the Mexican government was extricating itself from that and trying to fight back against mm -hmm. the cartels. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the status of that right now? And then I'm going to have a similar question about China. Well, that's an excellent question, actually, because you're right. When Felipe Calderón, the former president of Mexico, declared the war on drugs, and went after particularly the Zetas, right, the Los Zetas cartel, 
um, that was really when you saw a spike in the violence. And, and it was it was crazy to see people blaming Calderon, in a sense, because he was going after the cartels, which made them, you know, more violent. Mm-hmm. So not the cartels, fault. Oh, boy, wow, that's quite something. <laughs> I mean, I see where it comes from, but it's still ironic. Well, what has since happened, unfortunately, is that the cartels today have so much money. They have so much power. They're so violent. There's just no limits to what they will do to each other and to their own people and to innocent people in Mexico and beyond. Um, That the AMLO government of today is obviously taking orders from them. They function as a parallel shadow government. And so really the Mexican government is, exists in name only. It doesn't protect its people. 98% of murders in Mexico go uninvestigated, never mind prosecuted. Wow. You know, and you can keep going down the list. And, um, you know, one of the things that is very significant here, I'm not sure people, uh, I mean, they understand, but they don't really give it much thought. The U.S. strategy for dealing with the cartels in Mexico has been to rely entirely on law enforcement. The problem with that is that their jurisdiction ends where? It ends with sovereign territory. So DEA and others, they go to the U.S.-Mexico border, and that's where their jurisdiction is, you know, ends. Mm -hmm. So they have to go to Mexico, cap in hand, to the Mexican government, form relationships with their counterparts in law enforcement, and basically rely on Mexico's willingness to cooperate and extradite and the needs they have. Well, that doesn't work very well when the government is taking orders from the cartels, and they're the people you're going after, right? Yeah. And how do we know that? Well, just before the election, um, the Mexican government, with great speed, passed a set of new laws where they said, okay, no one in Mexico, no, US, uh, no Mexican law enforcement officer is allowed to have direct contact with American counterparts unless they report in writing what their engagement is about, and they have to go through a new thing, a new body called the fusion cell that is set up through the Mexican Foreign Office. So what does that tell you? It's a political body, right? And what does that do? It crushes all of the cooperation and the coordination and the relationships. Yeah. Because now It's like Mexico a sanctuary city. Memory. It's almost the well, equivalent of a sanctuary city. Um, yes, and, and plus, who's going to put their name on that, knowing that the cartel is going to go behead their children if they do? Well, exactly. And not only that, it, it sends a message to all the good Marines and policemen and other you know, people in Mexico that if you try to work with U.S. law enforcement, you know, we're not on your side. And at the same time, they took immunity from prosecution away from U.S. agents operating in Mexico. So what Mexico did was they doubled down on their sovereignty. And they doubled down on their border. Mm-hmm. And at the very same moment, the Biden administration basically opened the border and bypassed the legal administ- um, immigration system in wow. the United States. OK, so I'm going to skip the China question in the interest of of time. We've got about four minutes left. So okay, I'll be quicker. The, <laughs> it's all right. I could listen to you all day. So uh, when we now see the news stories that we see more on Fox than on other places that don't want to talk about it. You remember when Trump was president, we'd have AOC go down there and pretend to be crying outside of a cage. And now you've got similar stuff, not exactly the same, but similar stuff going on. And nobody in the mainstream media wants to talk about it. What I want to know from you is how serious is the problem? Should we think that this is really a crisis or is this something that maybe conservative media is overplaying? How should we think about it? Well, I've already outlined the security crisis, which yeah. nobody is dealing with and talking about. And that is a very, very serious crisis because, uh, you know, people don't really realize what that is costing the United States, not just in terms of those who have died. But the deaths would be much higher if um, people weren't distributing a drug called Narcan, which reverses um, overdoses Mm -hmm. all across this country. I mean, there are so many tens of thousands of doses of Narcan being administered. And people are coming back from those overdoses, but sometimes not with full brain function, Mm -hmm. right? And you only have to go to a city like San Francisco to see what illegal narcotics are doing. Remember that this is happening at a time when you have an administration that has come into power that is talking about legalizing hard drugs, and decriminalizing crossing the border, which they've effectively done already. And when you have this mass movement of people, you know that the people who know how to exploit that more than anyone else are the Mexican cartels. You cannot imagine how much more illegal product 
they are moving over that border, whether it's um, illicit money or weapons or, um, you know, narcotics. And then there's the whole issue of human smuggling, human trafficking. What you are looking at is the largest form of modern slavery in existence. Those people are coming across now. There's so many. The cartels are putting wristbands on them and identifying them by their wristbands, which relates back. There's a number there. It relates back to a computer that the cartels are running, and they've got a database on you. They know where your family is, how many children you have, if you pay all your fees, how many you have. And they have absolute control over you, not just in Mexico, not just in Guatemala or Honduras, but in the United States of America. What kind of quality of life are these people having? And how are you enabling the cartels? Because they have relationships with every street gang in America. This is not a border problem. This is an American problem. Every American town and every American city where illegal narcotics are consumed, you have cartels. And there are thousands of them. Cartel Jalisco New Generation has thousands of members in cities all across this country and in small towns. Don't think that you live in a small town. This ain't your problem. Mm -hmm. The CA will tell you they're buying up property in every part of America. So, And then you have the humanitarian issue. And what the Biden administration is doing is they're doing their level best to make this an invisible crisis where you're not seeing the caravans. They've sent $4.2 billion set aside to address the root causes of migration under Biden's plan. Well, a lot of that money is going to Guatemala and Mexico to get them to do what the U.S. wants, which is to break up those caravans into small groups once they hit Guatemala so that you don't see this mass movement of people. And if you don't have reporters who are right there when people are crossing to see those big groups, well, they just disappear mm -hmm. because they're pushing them through you know, the Border Patrol detains them for as short a period of time as possible. They're releasing people on their own recognizance, which is a short form. They don't know who they are. They don't know where, you know, really what they've done in their lives. They don't even know where they're going. And they're getting rid of them, handing them over to Department of Health and Human Services. They're being transported in buses with tinted windows, so you can't really see them. Health and Human Services, the Biden administration has made a big deal about how they want to get, you know, them processed as quickly as possible to reunite families. Well, unaccompanied minors, they didn't come over with families. So, you know, what are you talking about? You're not talking about people being separated at the border because unaccompanied minors under Trump or Biden or Obama, they were not with their families. Mm -hmm. They're actually talking about getting those children supposedly to their families in America who came illegally before, right? But you don't even know if they are their families. They don't do interviews anymore. Um, they don't do DNA testing anymore. They've stopped all of that. Wow. And uh, the families that you're talking about, you don't know if they're real families. You don't know if they owe a debt to the cartel. You, you have no idea. What the Border Patrol agents told me is under uh, um, Trump, actually, they found that a lot of these children were going to the same address in New Jersey over and over again. So they had ICE move in. ICE raided it, and they found ledgers where these children there were being uh, sex trafficked for sex. Well, how was ICE supposed to operate these days? They've been absolutely cut off at the knees. Mm -hmm. And everyone has been turned into a migrant care facility. Security has been set aside. And the media, well, you know, they act as political um, propaganda arm of the progressive movement, you know, and they don't do their jobs. Most people don't do their jobs. And there are good people. There are good journalists across, across the spectrum in all platforms. But unfortunately, we've abandoned our standards. We've abandoned our objectivity. We've abandoned our ethics. And, uh, and we are now farming I mean, the colleges are just farms for activists. We've created activists, and we call them journalists. And, uh, and they're, you know, political operatives are really calling the shots here. And that's very, very disappointing because it hurts all of us. I've never cared about politics. Nobody owns me. I don't work for the left, and I don't work for the right. I work for something called my job is to try to find the truth. And honestly, that's so hard. It's such an, an extraordinarily difficult job most of the time that I don't, uh, I, I, I've never even thought about doing anything other than that. You know, Laura, so to me, first of all, it's, uh, I'm grateful and it's important that you're out there seeking the truth the way you do. There's a reason that your show on Fox Nation is called Laura Logan Has No Agenda. I'm also, though, exceptionally disappointed how close to unique you seem. You shouldn't be as unique as you are. In, in seeking the truth and chasing down these stories. And, you know, for a guy whose college dorm was in the building next door to Columbia Journalism School and thinking about all the evil that's actually being perpetrated in that building right now, 
and all the harm to this country by training, as you p rightly point yeah. out, journalists to be propagandists and political activists. I, I just, I wish more people would just look at you as a, a, a role model for how to do a job, regardless of a particular issue. And anyway, I'm glad you're there doing what you're doing. Clearly, you, you care a lot. Well, you are very kind and you are very gracious. And I will say, fortunately, I am not the only one. There are others like Cheryl Atkinson yeah. and um, Adam Housley. And, you know, there are some young journalists that I have been trying to um, you know, trying to encourage and be there uh, to be the, you know, a sort of the two weeks they didn't teach you, you know, two weeks mm -hmm. of crash course and what they didn't teach you in journalism school about being a real journalist, right? And just be a, a, a guide and a mentor when people need me. And so... There are young people like Drew Hernandez is out there, um, you know, Jorge Ventura Media and Sergio Ramos. And these people, they're doing um, extraordinarily difficult work. And the worst part is the journalist establishment shuns them. Right. They don't ever get, you know, an invitation to walk through the door because they're covering things like Antifa and they're doing it honestly. And that's not acceptable. And that's really disappointing because there really should be more journalists, real journalists who care about, the craft and the product, and uh, and why we became journalists and what we can be when we do it our jobs um, right. And I have to say, you know, one of the, the one of the greater voices out there is Glenn Greenwald, you know, who's um, I, I there's a lot of stuff the Intercept does that you know I interesting don't, uh, character for sure agree with yeah yeah and 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 he's been a real force yeah. for the principles of uh, telling the truth to the point where he gave up his own position at the at the place he created. And that's, you know, there's sacrifice and risk, and there's a cost to standing up for principles. But we've created this kind of a culture and environment where, you know, you don't stand up for anything and you don't risk anything because you just hide under your desk and you go along with the narrative and nothing else matters except saving your own skin and being invited to the next cocktail party or, or the next award. Laura Logan is the host of Laura Logan Has No Agenda on Fox Nation, the pride of KwaZulu Natal. Donkey, Laura, and I'd love to have you back sometime. Oh, uh, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Donkey. Thank you. Bye, Laura. <laughs> All right. Wow. Uh, that was fantastic. It was also five minutes too long, so I'm going to hit a quick break right here. We'll be right back on The Ross Kaminsky Show. This is Denver's Talk Station with Ross Kaminsky now. Tom Martino at 10, 630 KHOW, Denver.